She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. And we're back to Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. It's like I feel bad for people who live in Idaho because before, Idaho was known for its potatoes. Not the most exciting thing, but still something delicious. Now I feel like Idaho is going to be known for the two most evil and crazy people that have ever walked this earth. The darkest of the dark leveled souls, if you will. We've debated and argued sometimes for almost a year about Lori and Chad. Are they crazy? Are they part of a cult? Are they just normal people who took the wrong path? What's the deal with these two people? And I mean, while we're talking about cults, let's have a quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Magellan TV, and the recommendation I have for you to watch on Magellan TV is about a cult. The family inside the Manson cult looks back at the twisted world of hate, fear, sexual transgression, and mind control of one of the world's most notorious villains, Charles Manson. He once had dreams of a Hollywood recording career. Fame was elusive, so he chose infamy. I really enjoyed this documentary. I like the way they set it up, kind of like a movie in some ways. They have um, a guy playing Charles Manson, and it's funny because every time you have somebody playing Charles Manson, they've got the same kind of like personality and look like, whoa, whoa, calm down, man, peace, peace. You know, this is the kind of guy, so. If you feel so strongly, why don't you kill me? Hmm? Take this knife, put it into my chest. Do you see that if I give you the right to kill me, then that gives me the right to kill you? It, the guy that got to play Charles Manson in this documentary is very good. It, it goes into a lot about the cult inside the family, as it, as it suggests. So I definitely recommend, especially if you're a fan of Charles Manson, and I know a lot of you are, because many, many of you watched my six-part series that I did on the Manson family over a year ago. Magellan TV is a new kind of documentary streaming service whose mission it is to bring you the finest documentaries from around the world. They believe in the power of telling real stories stories that have defined the human experience and point the way to the future. They call it television worth watching. Magellan TV was built by people who know what makes an excellent documentary or film. Actual filmmakers, actual documentary makers. They have over 2,000 documentary movies and series on Magellan TV right now and they add more every single week. Whether you're passionate about history, science, nature, true crime, or really anything else, there is something for everybody on Magellan TV. Magellan TV is also a available anytime, anywhere on your television, laptop, or mobile device. These programs stream ad-free. Many of them are in 4K for no additional cost. It's available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, iOS, and more. So pretty much there doesn't ever have to be a place where you can't sit down and enjoy a truly great documentary. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your tablet, you can watch it on your computer, you can watch it on your TV, you can start it on your TV and then pick it back up on your phone when you're on the treadmill. I love Magellan TV, I pay for Magellan TV out of my own pocket get every single month even though they're a sponsor of mine and technically I, I would be getting it free normally but I really wanted to support them because when I believe in something I want to put my money where my mouth is. They have been an excellent sponsor. They're an excellent company. They have an amazing customer service department. They have amazing content. You can click the link in the description box and try Magellan TV free for one month. No strings attached. You can cancel anytime. You can cancel after your one month. You can cancel after three or four months but I really don't think that you're going to want 
want to because they add more stuff all the time and you're never gonna get to watch everything you wanna watch. But while many of us are still stuck at home, why, why shouldn't we try? Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. As always, they have been an amazing sponsor. And thank you so much to you guys who have tried Magellan TV. Not only do you support that company, but you support this channel. And then we can talk about the things that you've watched together. All right, let's get started on this video about Lori and Chad. I mean, here we are again, talking about this case in which we keep thinking it can't get any worse, but without fail. It does. It gets so much worse. This past week, the probable cause affidavit was released in which we were able to get a better look at the timelines and what police have on Chad and Lori to not only support their original charges, but new charges as well. Chad Daybell now faces four felony charges for evidence destruction or concealment, and Lori is facing two counts of conspiracy to commit destruction, alteration, or concealment of evidence. These new charges seem to have come on the tail of the Rexburg police executing a search warrant on June 29th at the home of Chad Daybell in Salem, Idaho. Police were in and outside of the house. They were in the backyard and exterior buildings. They were also seen carrying out several brown evidence bags, but they haven't confirmed whether this search is connected to the new charges. Now, if you remember, Lori had already been in jail, but her charges were for felony, desertion, and non-support of minor children. Of course, after the bodies of JJ and Tylee were found, new charges would have to be necessary to hold Chad and Lori in jail still. And Court TV contributor Ashley Banfield believes that these charges are just placeholders for the eventual charge of homicide. So I went through the pages of the affidavit and what I read is disturbing and heartbreaking. And although, yes, it does give us some more insight into the when and the how for me, there's still no closure on the actual why. The author of this document was Detective Ron Ball with the Rexburg Police Department. The affidavit tells us when both children were last seen. Ty Lee was last seen in pictures at Yellowstone National Park with her brother JJ, her mother Lori, and her uncle Alex Cox. And this was on September 8th, 2019. JJ was last seen by Lori's friend Melanie Gibb on September 22nd, 2019 at Lori's apartment. Now, Lori and the kids both moved to Rexburg with Alex Cox on September 1st, and within that same month, both of Lori's children disappeared. I want to start off talking about that first week in September, two days before Tylee was last seen. Alex Cox's cell phone was located inside the home of Chad Daybell. He was there for only a very short time, but we have to ask ourselves, what was he doing there? And we'll get to that in a moment. On September 8th, Alex's phone was located at Yellowstone National Park, which is verified by those pictures in which, can I just say, Alex looks totally unbothered. This is not the face of a man who knows he's about to take the lives of two children, kids he's known and been a part of raising for years. I kept searching his face in this picture for some sign of stress, some indication of fear or sadness, but I found none of it. He looks like a normal, happy guy spending a lovely afternoon with his family out in nature. Something else has been reported incorrectly to us. At this time when this picture was taken, Tylee Ryan was only 16 years old. And although we've been told and it's been said everywhere she was 17, the authorities now believe she died before her 17th birthday, which would have been just two weeks later on September 24th. The reason it was reported she was 17 is because she wasn't reported missing until many months later, but now the sad reality is that Tylee probably never even got to see her 17th birthday. At 6.40 p.m., Alex's phone left Yellowstone Park via the west entrance, and five minutes later, he was at Buckaroo's Barbecue Grill in West Yellowstone for only 17 minutes. Now, 17 minutes isn't really enough time to stay and sit down and eat, so I suspect he just picked up food. But I can't help but wonder, was he picking up food for just himself or for Lori and the kids as well? Was this Tylee's last meal? 
Did she request it, knowing what he was about to do? Did Alex and Lori ask Tylee what she wanted to eat that night in some twisted show of sympathy or in a misguided attempt to make them feel like good people and do something nice for a young girl that wouldn't be alive to see the sunrise the next day? Did they get the food and sit outside, watch the sunset, talk about the future, Tylee's college plans, etc.? They'd all driven to Yellowstone together in Alex's Ford F-150, so it does make sense that Tylee and JJ and Lori would have been with Alex when he stopped at this barbecue place and it makes sense that he would have gotten them all food. And that means something knowing it was probably the last thing Tylee ever ate. At 8.37 p.m., Alex and his phone were back in Rexburg at Lori's apartment until 9.43 p.m. He then left and went to the Maverick gas station on Main Street in Rexburg. According to the affidavit, he left there at 9.53, and it doesn't really say where he was again until 10.45 when he's back at Lori's apartment. They have his cell phone records, they have his GPS, they have all of that stuff, so I expect that they know where he was in that, that time period. He left the gas station before 10 o'clock. He wasn't back at Lori's until 10.45. Did he go home? Do the police not think it's important to say he went home? Or was he someplace else and the police don't wanna say where he was because they wanna keep that close to the vest? But anyways, he's back at Lori's at 10.45 p.m. and he left her apartment at 11.15. And then his phone is back at his own unit in the same complex at 11.45. Once again, the affidavit does not indicate where he was between 11.15 and 11.45, but it does show that he returned to Lori's apartment in the middle of the night at 2.42 in the morning, and he doesn't return to his own unit again until 4.37 in the morning, and he stays there until 8.59 a.m. Now this is significant, according to Detective Ball. This was the only time since they'd lived in this complex in which Alex had gone to Lori's apartment between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. This shows he didn't make a habit of paying his sister creepy late night visits, but this day, this night, this evening, it was the exception, not at all the rule. Once Alex leaves his own apartment on the morning of September 9th at, you know, about 8.59 a.m., after being at Lori's apartment without any obvious reason for hours in the middle of the night, he heads right over to our buddy Chad Daybell's house and he arrives there at 9.21 a.m. He is there for two and a half hours and his phone pinged at the east end of the property, right over the pet cemetery that Chad and Tammy had in their yard and also right on top of the location that police would later find the body of 16-year-old Tylee Ryan. Let's talk about how Tylee was found. The area that her remains were uncovered in was located behind a red unattached outbuilding that was roughly at the center of the property near a fire pit. This area next to the fire pit is where the Daybell family would bury their pets and once again where Alex's phone pinged on September 9th, the day after Tylee was last seen. The morning after Alex had paid an unexpected middle of the night visit to his psycho sister. The investigators found several areas of disturbed ground and uncovered remains of a buried cat and a few buried dogs. They brought in a backhoe to dig further and they found bricks that were, you know, kind of buried about a foot down. The dirt around and on top of the bricks was sifted through and searched and multiple human bones as well as charred and uncharred tissue belonging to a human were found. Forensic anthropologist Dr. Sarah Getz was able to determine that these bones were the bones of a child under the age of 18. So as I had speculated in the last video that we talked about this, it seems Tylee's body had been burned, which we concluded after one of Chad's neighbors commented on massive bonfires happening at the Daybell residence close to the date of her disappearance and near the location where her remains were found. We now find out that this girl's body was not only burned, but dismembered. And the day that Alex Cox was on Chad Daybell's property, right at that location where she'd be found, and the day after she was last seen, Chad sent his then alive and well wife, Tammy Daybell, a text message at 11.53, 14 minutes after Alex Cox left. This is what that text message said. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. 
Three minutes later, he texted her again. Gonna shower now, and then go right for a while at BYU. Love you. Now, Tammy texted her husband back at 2.47 p.m., and her text said, good for you. And then a minute later, Chad texts, I'm back home now. Now, this is important for many reasons. Firstly, raccoons are nocturnal creatures. They typically don't come out during the day. It's not to say that they never come out during the day. There's many reasons you might see one out in the middle of the day. They may have been scared out of their den by another animal or a human, so they're forced to relocate during the day. If a raccoon is pregnant, their usual patterns may be interrupted, and a mother raccoon may find herself needing to forage for food during the day to feed herself enough to nurse a new litter. It's not terribly common, but it's common enough to not assume right off the bat he's lying, right? even though it's Chad Daybell. However, the police located the remains of dogs and cats in that pet cemetery, but they found no remains of a raccoon. Now, apparently, neighbors of the Daybells had asked Chad's son, Garth, about a gunshot they'd heard on their property, and Garth had told them that his father had shot a raccoon out of a tree in the middle of the day. These neighbors also told police that the fire pit on the Daybell property was hardly ever used, but it had been used frequently in the months leading up to July. The first one that was noticed by them was soon after the death of Tammy Daybell in mid-October. On June 2nd, Tammy Daybell's sister Samantha was contacted by police and questioned about the presence of a pet cemetery on the Daybell property, and Samantha confirmed that both she and her sister Tammy were very fond of their pets and they they both kept pet cemeteries at their homes. In my humble opinion, I think those messages sent to Tammy from Chad were his attempt to give himself an alibi, which leads me to speculate if Tylee Ryan was shot by Alex and or Chad. There was clearly no raccoon. It was a lie. The only reason I can think of to make up a story like that is to cover your bases. That way, if anyone asks your kids or you or your wife, why they'd heard a gunshot in the middle of the day coming from your property, then everybody would have an answer. I think Tammy also probably found this text odd, along with the update like, I'm gonna go shower now, going to BYU now, I'm back home. She answers, good for you. And I feel like this is how I would answer my husband if he started giving me like on the minute updates about what the hell he was doing in the middle of the day when I didn't even ask. But that's just my opinion. Don't come for me. I think they killed Tylee. I think they buried her, and when suspicion started coming their way, they dug up the body and attempted to burn it in order to hide what they'd done. Okay, back to September. On the 18th, Lori Vallow interviewed a babysitter for JJ, and this sitter was hired. This woman wanted to remain anonymous, but she said that Lori was, quote, very welcoming and gave me a hug. Their home was clean and had a picture of a tumble on the wall, end quote. Lori told the new babysitter that her husband, Charles, had just died from a heart attack. Lori also talked about her oldest daughter, Ty Lee, who by this time was already missing. Lori knew that Ty Lee was gone, but she told the babysitter that Ty Lee didn't like watching JJ unless she was getting paid. Lori said Ty Lee was going to college and would sometimes come home to do laundry, but had never lived with them there at that townhouse in Rexburg. I don't know why this pisses me off so much. First of all, Ty Lee was 16 years old, and even though Lori was telling everyone she was enrolled at BYU, she wasn't. So it makes me mad because Ty Lee should have been making plans for college and going to visit campuses and picking out her mini fridge for her dorm room, but instead, she was lying dead in the ground next to Chad Daybell's dogs and cats. And on top of that, even though her daughter was dead and Lori knew it and Lori was partially responsible for that, she had the balls to talk negatively about her daughter to this stranger and tell this stranger that Tylee didn't like to watch JJ unless she was benefiting monetarily from it. And that is so far from the truth. Tylee loved JJ. She loved being with him and playing with him. She was more of a mother to him than Lori ever was. And after ending Tylee's life, Lori goes on to basically make her sound like some stupid, shallow teenager who wants to get paid to spend time with her brother. 
It's disgusting. Lori is the stupid one. Lori is the shallow one. Lori's the one that wants to get paid. And I think she really hated and resented Tylee for her true and good and pure heart. She probably hated that Tylee would get so much praise from Colby and others about how much Tylee loved JJ, about how good she was to him. I mean, they called Tylee his second mother. Do you think Lori liked that? A normal mother, a good mother who wanted to raise her kids to be good people no matter what, would have been proud of that, but not Lori, because Lori liked the spotlight. Lori wanted to be Mother Teresa. Lori wanted to be the saint in everybody's mind. And everybody's over here talking about how great Tylee is, and Lori's like, but what about me? I think Tylee was a truly good person, and Lori wanted to be a truly good person or considered herself to be a truly good person, but she knew she could never be as good as her daughter, Tylee. Take this bowl of soup, for instance. This is not a bet, this was not planned. My eight-year-old son just came down here and he handed me this bowl of soup that he made, this bowl of chicken soup that he made, because I have a pinched nerve in my neck and I spent most of yesterday on my back crying about it and he felt bad and he wanted me to feel better. So even though chicken soup doesn't help a pinched nerve, his love and care for me does. We want to raise our kids to be good people. We want to raise our kids to be even better than we are. That's the point. We want them to be more financially stable than we were. We want them to be more successful than we were. We want them to be more empathetic, more compassionate, more kind than we were. That's how we make the world better. Lori did not feel that way. So I'm going to put this chicken soup down and then continue while it cools. Lori didn't want the competition for sainthood. I truly think that she resented Tylee, and I think that's why Tylee is dead. And that gives me, at least from my opinion, what the why might be, what the motive might be. But you let me know what you guys think in the comments. So this babysitter, she came back and watched JJ the next day, and she was under the impression that this would be a long-term sort of situation. Lori had told her that she was struggling with JJ because he had special needs and she was overwhelmed. So she would need this babysitter, you know, several times a week maybe. And that day, the babysitter came to stay with JJ while Lori went to the airport to pick up her friend Melanie Gibb and Melanie's boyfriend, David Warwick, who were coming into town. Now Lori told the babysitter, if I get home late, you know, just give JJ his meds right before bed because they make him tired quickly. She joked about how she liked that because some days when JJ was extra tough for her to handle, she would give him his meds and put him to bed early so she could get a break. At first, JJ was upset when Lori left, but after she was gone, he calmed down and he played with the neighborhood kids for most of the afternoon. Later, however, he did have a little bit of a breakdown. He threw a chair, he flipped the ottoman, and then he ran upstairs. The babysitter found him hiding under Lori's bed. Now, this woman claims that JJ had his own bedroom, but there was no bed in it. There was, however, a thin, twin-sized mattress on the floor of Lori's room with sheets and a pillow on it. What is going on with this mattress on the floor of Lori's room. Either Lori never got JJ a bed because she knew he wasn't going to be around long enough to need one and she made him sleep on the floor of her room or JJ was in so much distress. After losing his father and his support dog because Lori gave the dog back after she tried to sell it, maybe JJ was too afraid to sleep on his own in his own room. Either way, it's heartbreaking. Clearly, JJ loved Lori. He was upset when she left that day. When he was having a hard time that night, he hid under her bed, a place he felt he could be closest to her when she wasn't home. If he was sleeping in Lori's room because he was afraid, it's because being in the same room as Lori made JJ feel safe. Knowing what happened to JJ at the hands of his mother, her new husband, and his own uncle, that's incredibly sad because he wasn't safe with her. And no matter how much he loved her, she would never love him back. JJ was a young child who had lost his father, lost his support dog, moved from his town and school and friends to a new town and a new school where he didn't have any friends. He lost his sister. He wasn't allowed to see or talk to his grandparents. That's a lot for any kid especially one with special needs who would struggle with any change in routine. All of that going on in his life 
And Lori didn't even open up her bed to him. She didn't allow him to snuggle with her under the covers. She didn't allow him to anchor himself to a person who was probably the only person he had in the world, or at least the only person he felt he had in the world. She made him sleep on the floor like a dog. So Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend David were at Lori's townhouse and Melanie claims that Lori began telling her JJ was a zombie and she knew this because of the way he was acting. She said he would sit still while watching television and his vocabulary had increased. She claimed he also said he loved Satan. Now, Melanie had seen Chad explain the zombie theory to Lori before, but when she observed JJ, Melanie felt that he was acting no differently than he had any other time. Here's what I think happened. I think Lori told Melanie all this ridiculous stuff like, look at the way he's sitting there and watching TV. He's a zombie. He just used the word stentorian. He's a zombie. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? Many kids sit and watch TV, and sometimes if they're really interested in what they're watching, it's not like they're gonna be bouncing all over the place. And I mean, many kids also get better in their vocabulary as they get older. It's called learning or word of the day calendars. So I think when Lori said this stuff to Melanie, Melanie was like, that's kind of crazy. What, what are you talking about? That's normal stuff. So Lori felt like she had to up the ante and she was like, oh, well, you think that's normal? He also told me yesterday that he loved Satan. I don't think JJ ever said he loved Satan. I can't imagine why he would ever do or say that, but even if he did, it doesn't mean he's a zombie, obviously, but I think that Lori felt Melanie wasn't taking her seriously, so she really had to like shock her with the Satan thing. Melanie claimed she'd also been on the phone with Lori in the past after Lori and the kids had moved to Rexburg and before Tylee went missing, and she'd heard Lori refer to Tylee as a zombie. She'd also heard Tylee respond, no, not me, mom. Like, this seems like something that Tylee probably had to deal with a lot that Lori would just randomly be going throughout her day and point at her and be like, you're a zombie. And Tylee would have to say, no, mom, remember we talked about this. I'm, I'm not a zombie. It's just me. It's just Tylee, not a zombie. That poor girl, I think about Tylee in the months before her death, growing up, dealing with this crazy cuckoo banana stuff that her mother was talking about, seeing that her mother was losing her grip on reality, knowing that JJ needed to be taken care of, because Tylee most likely thought, you know, I'm going to be out of here in a year or so, but I want to make sure JJ is still going to be taken care of because he's going to be left with this woman. And then imagine being Tylee and you think you're going to go to your, your aunt Melanie Boudreaux, your uncle Alex Cox, and they'll help you and they'll be the voice of reason and they will talk to Lori and, you know, calm her and tell her that she's not doing the right thing and she needs to focus on taking care of her kids, but instead they're all in on it. Lori moved Tylee and JJ out to Rexburg away from people who were normal and logical and surrounded her with people who were just as bananas as Lori was. It's what abusers do to their victims. They isolate them, they pull them away from everybody else who's normal and knows that what they're doing is crazy so that the only people around are the people who believe this crazy crap. Tylee most likely felt so just confused and frustrated, like there was nobody there to help her. So Melanie Gibb and David, Melanie's boyfriend, actually stayed with Lori at her townhouse the weekend of September 22nd and 23rd. Now on the evening of September 22nd, Melanie, David, and Lori had been planning to record a podcast, but JJ was acting up. So JJ's uncle Alex had agreed to take JJ over to his apartment so they could get their podcast done. The last time anyone ever saw JJ was late on the night of September 23rd when David Warwick saw Alex carrying JJ home. JJ appeared to be sleeping. His head was resting on Alex's shoulder and David remembered thinking, wow, this is a very tender and special moment to see this little boy with his head on his uncle's shoulder, slumbering peacefully in the arms of someone who he trusted and felt would keep him safe. The next morning between 8 and 9 a.m., David and Melanie woke up and David asked Lori where JJ was. Lori told them that JJ had, quote, been acting like a zombie and had been crawling on the kitchen cabinetry and the ceiling. She informed Warwick and Gibb that when JJ had climbed upon the cabinetry, he had not a picture of Jesus off the refrigerator. Lori then told Melanie and David that Alex had come and picked JJ up. So Lori wants to do her podcast, you know, she thinks she's like this huge person in the um, warrior up 
Mormon world of podcasting, I suppose. And she's she's mad because JJ's, you know, bouncing off the walls like kids do when they're not being paid attention to. I mean, I get it. I'm, I've been there every single day. As I'm recording this, my son has come down four times to, to say hi or to bring me soup or, you know, to just make sure I'm still here, I guess. Whatever, I don't mind. It's disruptive, but, you know, you've got kids. But Lori's mad because she, she wants to do her podcast because people need to hear from her. And David, Melanie's boyfriend, saw JJ sleeping, he thought, on Alex's shoulder that night as Alex was bringing him home. Bringing him home from his apartment to Lori's townhouse. But then the next morning when they wake up, JJ's not there again, right? Gone. And David wants to know where he is. And Lori says he was he was legitimately now climbing the cabinets like in, in The Exorcist and crawling on the walls. And Alex came to pick him up. And I don't know, did Melanie and David say, oh, oh, he was crawling on the ceiling. Yeah, I can completely understand why you would, you know, want him to, to get out and, and get some energy out and not be crawling on your ceilings anymore. Don't want fingerprints on your ceilings. Once again, made up. We clearly know, logically, you and I, that J.J. Vallow was not crawling on the ceilings like that, that chick from Coco. We know most likely J.J. had been killed by his uncle the night before, and what David actually saw was Alex walking back with JJ's dead body. So Lori told her friends that Alex came to pick up JJ, but he wasn't at Lori's townhouse that morning. That morning, Alex was on the property of Chad Daybell from 9.55 a.m. to 10.12 a.m. His cell phone pinged at the northern edge of the property by the pond, the same location that JJ's remains would later be found. Alex was only there on the property for 17 minutes, which seems like a very short time, but let's analyze the way JJ was found and see if we can't make sense of this. On June 9th, police found a patch of ground that appeared to be disturbed. The weed growth on this patch was significantly shorter than the surrounding weed growth and sod etching was present. This disturbed area was approximately four feet by two and a half feet. They removed the top layer of sod and they found underneath that several flat rocks. Under the rocks were two pieces of flat paneling and under that a round object covered in black plastic which was accompanied by a strong odor. I'll read right from the affidavit for this part. Quote, an FBI ERT member used a small sharp instrument and made a small incision in the plastic and a layer of white plastic was observed. An incision was made in the white layer of plastic exposing what appeared to be human remains, the crown of a head covered in light brown hair. JJ was found wrapped tightly in two layers of plastic and then secured with duct tape. But here's the thing, only his head was found wrapped in that white plastic, while his entire body, including his head, was wrapped in that black plastic. So now, just as I had speculated before that Tylee was shot due to the stupid raccoon story, I'm going to speculate if JJ was suffocated to death. Ashley Banfield from Core TV had the same question and she posed it to a forensic expert, Joseph Scott Morgan. The first thing that jumps to mind, Ash, is the fact that JJ's body was wrapped in plastic and that in and of itself is going to be a source for a wealth of information and evidence. You know, we've got things like latent fingerprints, hair, uh, dead skin cells, uh, which, you know, arises uh, touch DNA and people are thinking, well, the body was buried. You're going to have dirt on the outside. You're not going to have dirt on the inside, potentially. So they have to be very, very careful when they're even removing the packaging that the body is in because any disruption in that can disturb this very, very fragile evidence. And then beyond that, you know, you're going to be thinking uh, from uh, a kind of a chemical level relative to J.J., uh, he did have the bag over his head, and, and you know, my thought is, is this a, a means in order to, say, for instance, suffocate J.J.? I don't know, maybe so, but how do you get him to that point where you can place a bag over his head and kind of hold him in stasis, if you will, long enough to do that? That's where toxicology comes in. Because of the way he was buried, JJ's body was surprisingly well preserved, and Morgan believes this will produce a nice amount of forensic evidence, such as latent fingerprints and DNA, but he also wondered what might have happened to JJ before this bag was placed over his head to render him incapable of pulling it off or clawing it off in order to breathe? And that's where toxicology will be very important. 
While all of this is happening, people are on his property. Chad Daybell sat in his vehicle in his driveway and watched. The police officer is very interested, obviously, in where they were digging. He also apparently moved his SUV at some point across the street where his daughter lived and parked it in front of the residence of his daughter around the time that the investigators found JJ's head. Chad Daybell pulled away from his daughter's residence and two officers pursued him, which is kind of funny because I specifically remember his lawyer rambling on about how Chad wasn't a flight risk. And if my calculations are correct, that's the second time Chad tried to run away from justice. Now on September 24th, the new babysitter called Lori and asked when she'd be needing her services again. And Lori informed her that the babysitter would no longer be needed as JJ had gone to live with his grandmother for a month while Lori was in Hawaii. The babysitter reached back out around Halloween and didn't even get a response this time because that's Lori. When Lori's done with you, it's as if you no longer exist. She uses people for her own gain and then just tosses them aside like trash. She couldn't even give this girl a text back. And then in November, Chad and Lori called Melanie Gibb and asked her to lie to the police and tell them that JJ was with her. When Melanie asked where JJ actually was, Lori said that she'd basically tricked Kay Woodcock into taking JJ by lying and saying that she, Lori, had cancer. She claimed that she traveled with JJ and handed him off to Kay in the airport herself. Like what? What? This woman lies as easily as she breathes, but she can't come up with a better story that doesn't make her sound like a complete psychopath. Who lies about having cancer? Who admits to lying about having cancer? Not that this ever happened, of course. She never told Kay that she had cancer and she never sent JJ to live with Kay, although she easily could have, but it just doesn't make any sense. Why would that be the lie she told? Something that makes her sound so awful. Well, either way, Lori isn't smirking anymore. This past Wednesday, Lori appeared in court with her lawyer and listened to the new charges being brought against her. She meekly answered the judge's questions. Her voice wavered as if she was holding back tears. She dabbed at her eyes daintily, wiping away all her fake emerging tears. And once again, just my opinion, don't come for me, but this was all just an act. Lori's son Colby and his wife were present on the Zoom call and I think she was once again manipulating her son or attempting to manipulate him into feeling sympathy for her. Miss Daybell, do you read, speak, and understand the English language? Yes. Miss Daybell, did you uh, get a copy of a notification of rights form prior to the hearing here today? Yes. Did you get a chance to review that notification of rights uh, with your attorney? Yes. Do you understand all of your legal rights here today? Yes. Ms. Daybell, did you also receive a copy of the warrant for your arrest as well as the amended criminal complaint that has been filed in this matter? Yes. A good person would feel sad about this. A good person would find themselves in tears about this, but Lori is not a good person. She has consistently showed us over these past months that she has no negative emotion when it comes to what happened to her children. She and Chad lied about where those kids were for as long as they could get away with it. They asked Melanie to lie for them. Chad told Tammy's sister that Lori didn't have any young children. Lori told people Tylee was going to college. She told people that JJ was with the Woodcocks. Chad pretended he barely knew Lori when he was married to her. They were laughing on a beach and dancing around like damn fools with costume jewelry on their fingers, a representation of the farce that their marriage was, in my opinion, while those kids decomposed in the ground. Tylee dismembered and burnt. Lori, do you remember when your daughter Tylee was born? Do you remember how small her baby hands were as they grasped at you? Do you remember how soft her skin was after you gave her a bath? Do you remember that new baby smell and the feeling of you know soft little baby hair tickling your chin as you rocked her to sleep? That same little girl, that same baby, you allowed to be murdered, dismembered, and burnt. That same little girl who watched you putting your makeup on in the morning and mimicked you because she just wanted to be like her mama. That same little girl who scraped her knees when she fell off her bike and you tended to her wounds as if they were life-threatening because you couldn't stand to see her in pain. She's gone and it's because of you. You let somebody put her in the ground with pets. So save your tears for someone who gives a shit, but you might have a hard time finding even one person who does. No one feels bad for you. 
probably not even Colby. And yes, it is more than likely that Lori didn't do any of her own dirty work. I have no doubt that she left all of that to Alex and Chad. Melanie Gibb once asked Alex before he died, do I really want to know what happened to JJ? And he responded, you don't want to know. But does it really matter if Lori didn't pull the trigger, figuratively or literally speaking, if she didn't use her own two hands to end the lives of those children? In my opinion, not even a little bit. Her hands are still dirty. The dirtiest, if you ask me. She was responsible for them. She could have saved them. She could have gone off and lived her nutso cult life with her nutso cult husband in peace and send JJ to the Woodcocks and let Tylee go away to college. No one would have bothered her. No one would have cared that she was teleporting all over the place under the orders of God. No one would have even noticed, to be honest. She involved them in her insane delusions. JJ's crawling on the ceiling and saying he loves Satan? Come on, either she's clinically insane and literally having hallucinations, or she's a liar and a murderer and the most hated woman in America, a title previously held by Casey Anthony. Well, no, they're tied. So the day after JJ was last seen, Alex goes to Chad Daybell's house, but he's only there for 17 minutes, so people are saying that's not enough time to dig the kind of hole or, or grave, essentially, that JJ was found in, which was you know four foot by two and a half feet. I completely agree, it wasn't. It was enough time to put him in that hole that had previously been dug, however. So Alex and Chad, who used to be a grave digger, might I add, don't know if you know that, some of you do, I'm sure, but Chad used to dig graves for a living to get some extra money and he loved it. So Chad and Alex could have easily dug that grave maybe when Alex was there disposing of Tylee's body or maybe one of the many times that Alex was there just chatting and hanging out with Chad. And that's why I said we'll get to that later. But I think that Alex came to um, Chad Daybell's house a couple of days before Tylee disappeared because he wanted to get everything ready. He probably told Chad like, hey, this is the, the plan, this is the schedule, I'm gonna do Tylee first and then I'm gonna do JJ and these are probably the days it's gonna happen so I need you to be prepared, like a hole has to be dug, um, you know, we're gonna have to maybe get rid of some evidence, like we're gonna have to do it like this, we're gonna need some flat rocks, we're gonna need some bags and some duct tape and Chad probably just got everything ready so that when it did happen, they worked as a pretty flawless team. And that's why I said at the beginning, the why of all of this is still very much a mystery. JJ and Tylee didn't have to die. No one would have questioned why Lori no longer wanted to care for JJ once Charles was gone. No one would have thought, that's odd, Tylee's attending college. Why did Lori, Chad, and Alex feel that in order to realize their delusions, their dreams, Two innocent children had to be sacrificed, and I leave you with that question. Maybe you can give me some theories or speculation. Maybe you can see some shadowy motive that I've missed, but I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Thank you guys so much for being here with me today. We will keep an eye on this case as always as updates come. I am very, very uh, much looking forward to a trial to see all the dirty details come out, and I really, really want to hear what Lori and Chad have to say for themselves. Are they gonna take the stand? Are they gonna give a statement in their own defense? Or are they gonna avoid ever, ever telling anybody why? so that nobody has closure. Remember to like this video if you liked it. Remember to comment and let me know what you think. Remember to subscribe if you're not subscribed and turn on the bell notification so YouTube tells you whenever I post a video. A lot of people have been telling me that they've been unsubscribed from my channel. A lot of people are telling me they're not getting notifications when I post, so just make sure that you have all notifications on. Also, if you think this video is worth sharing, please go ahead and share it and follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Everything is in the description box and don't forget to check out Magellan TV. Also a link in the description box for one month free, best documentary streaming service out there in my humble opinion. I also want to give a shout out to one of my subscribers, Charlotte Blythe, or Charlie, as she likes to be called. She's turning 37 on July 7th, and her husband emailed me and said that she was a big fan and it would really make her day if I could tell her happy birthday. And of course, I wish you the very happiest of birthdays, Charlie, and I love your name. I love people who are named Charlotte that go by Charlie. It's the best. It made me want to change my name. It made me want to change my name to Charlotte just so I could go by Charlie. But happy birthday to Charlie. Happy birthday to anybody else out there who's selling a birthday right now. Remember, 
selling a birthday, celebrating a birthday. We're not selling our birthdays. I wish we could sell our birthdays and then act like they didn't happen, but remember, the birthdays do happen. They are inevitable. They come every single year. That means you age every single year. So just embrace it and accept it and celebrate it because you are one year older, one year smarter, one year better. Thank you for all the time you give me. Thank you for all the love you give me. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Stay safe and I'll see you very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go